Uh, well, this is not an aviation love story. <laughs> the driver that uh, operated for Mertzis and Air Services in WA arrived uh, from Sydney in, on the 25th of July, 69. Um, it was the uh, Mark III version fitted with 180 horsepower light coming engines as already discussed this matter earlier. Um, a little bit over, uh, over information here, but, uh, but anyway, we did it individually. Uh, previous owner of TA and uh, RFDS and merged and registered the name Southern Airlines for it to operate on the Rodnest Airlines service. The aircraft was purchased as a cheap, op uh, cheap option to operate the RPT service after Jimmy Woods and MMA abandoned the route when DCA Regulation, Regulation 203 was adopted to allow RPT services to be operated by general aviation companies. Uh, when I first laid my, high, uh, my eyes on it, my mind turned immediately to World War II, the Junkers 52 and the Savoy Marchetti 94, both powered by three engines. The operating manual for the driver consisted of only 48 pages, not like these days. <laughs> it was read uh, without the follow-up uh, exams of today. Uh, my endorsement flight took place at Perth Airport on 27th of July 1969 under the charge of de Havilland Australian test pilot Ted Shaw. Maybe some people here might uh, remember the name. I remember being a little apprehensive as it was going to be my first tail dragging experience and worse, the cockpit, like the Dragon Repeat, only had one seat and Ted stood in the open space yelling instructions over my right shoulder. It still makes me laugh today when the one hour, 30 minute endorsement period went into my logbook as dual. <laughs> uh, I'll just go through the list of, uh, your hands go everywhere, with the, the, uh, yeah, the hands go everywhere with this aircraft, I must say. The throttle's on top and mixture at the bottom see them over on the left there. The carburetor heat levers were difficult to get uh, to get out because um, you had to put your right arm uh, right across the, your body uh, to your uh, top of your left shoulder to reach the, the rear belt head. I don't know if you can appreciate that but um, you're sitting there and you're right here because you've got the uh, your hands full on the left side. So I, I, I don't remember using the carburetor heat very often. <laughs> the flaps are actuated uh, by a hydraulic jack under the seat, um, then by cables to the wings, and then controlled by a lever on the right side of the seat. The brakes, similar to the chippy, as already discussed this morning, or this afternoon, uh, obscured in this picture, but a lever handle on the left side of the seat, uh, and a ratchet system controlled by a thumb button on top of the handle. I found it difficult to get used to that in the beginning, I can tell you. Um, note the trim wheel is adjacent to the uh, flap lever. Uh, that's uh, on the right hand side, well, as we're looking at it, that's the seat looking backwards on it. So all these things uh, made your hands go all over the place. Uh, all, I couldn't believe it. And the overview of the cockpit. All that weight of this particular driver was 6,500, um, as Alan said. Uh, 6,500 pounds. And the operations manual used a quaint terminology by today's standards. For example, normal operating limited speed is an airspeed indicated reading of 125 knots. Today it's either speed or green arc, etc. <laughs> uh, the manual also, uh, also stipulates the engine starting sequence. Um, it is from right to left and using only one magneto until the engine fires up. Now I've forgotten all about that as well. Yes, right, yeah. I do acknowledge that the driver was fun to fly because it was different and we didn't have to fly long distances. Uh, 1,500 feet is all we flew at, um, but up to eight return flights uh, a day uh, on the weekends, and it got a bit much by the end of the day. The flight's uh, air time was about 12 minutes, and the crosswind the landings into the afternoon sea breeze could be very challenging, as probably a lot of people here would know. Um, first flights of the day carried newspapers usually, uh, only uh, newspapers usually, and in the winter, the rain would dribble through the front screen seals and occasionally we would see uh, water spouts and uh, the occasional 
uh, whale. Engine synchronization was easy on the Drover. Just set the center engine RPM and then adjust the two outers by the reflections shown on the spinners. <laughs> True story. Um, the air traffic control was a lot more personal um, in the uh, 60s. Once I was asked why um, my takeoff um, on runway 21 was using up too much runway, I replied, I'm just trying to see if it'll get off the ground with only the centre engine spinning. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Another instance, on a weekend day of seven trips, I was beam the uh, city and uh, and all of a sudden, I remembered uh, to tell the tower I'd forgot uh, to get a takeoff uh, clearance and a right turn clearance. And the, the reply came back uh, for the take, clear for takeoff, make right turn. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't get that sort of uh, re response uh, these days. It's all very much legalese. <laughs> Lastly, I only did uh, 67 hours in the FTS and. Um, Right now, it's uh, being restored at the Caloundra Aviation Museum in Queensland. It's going to go back to a Mark I with the gypsy engines in it. So uh, that's it for my story on the Drover. Any questions? Uh, I'd like to uh, bring Mal Yo to the, to the forum because uh, Mal's going to give the vote of thanks for our wonderful two speakers. Thank you. A very interesting uh, talk from, well, <laughs> I'll talk about Harry in a minute. Was that he only had a few minutes of, of actual talking, so I'll talk about Alan. He obviously had to do a lot of work putting together the, uh, this particular project, but um, it sounds like Harry had to put together a whole lot more to fly the aeroplane. Talking about, um, I was uh, I actually saw a drover at Maylands Aerodrome back in '58, so. I think it had flying doctor aircraft uh, markings at the time, so I'm not quite sure how that managed to escape from New South Wales to here, because I understand that they were originally made for the flying doctor service on that side of Australia, because no one really thought about the side of Australia at the time, because there was no iron discovered here. <laughs> um, the I, I actually have also seen the Dragon down at because uh, I spent a, a year down at Busselton there, where. I saw dragons do all sorts of funny things which were not recorded probably by the Department of Name Changes. Um, I, I thought that uh, actually probably the basic thing I, I learnt was that the aircraft didn't have uh, fixed pitch propellers on, on all the aircraft. I often wondered how you, uh, how you would manage to, to feather the the nasty prop, I gather, though, that you probably couldn't feather any of the nasty props. But it, with thick, I was told it had three um, Tiger Moth engines in it, and uh, so therefore I assumed that uh, all of those were fixed pitch. However, that was uh, it was interesting. I found it very interesting because it was coming through history somewhat with me. And one of the things it really underlined was um, the difference between aircraft made by the British and aircraft made by the Americans. Uh, now I realise this aircraft was not made by the British but you, you've got to believe with de Havilland there it was all designs sent or, or modified when they got out to Australia because all its predecessors were also de Havilland although not de Havilland Australia. And that automatically took me back to thinking how great it was when I first saw my the first Beechcraft Bonanza in pieces at the time which had been imported and was standing in the hangar at, um, at the Royal Aero Club out of Maylands and it preceded the Cessnas but in fact I thought initially it was a Cessna because there'd been talk about one coming to Australia well subsequently uh, when one got to fly one uh, it was a real revelation compared with a thing like the Chipmunk and the de Havilland line of aircraft. And um, I can remember Cliff Holmes, I was telling the story of one of my friends a moment ago, to told me about uh, British aircraft, uh, the Chipmunk, who I was learning to fly on. I asked him as a student pilot 
asked Cliff Holmes why the switches weren't labelled. And he told me the story that you had to know your cockpit and therefore you had to know if your lights failed at night in the dark what all the switches were for. And because Cliff said that, and he was on the left hand of God, I, I assumed that was right. Um, subsequently, however, I, I thought it was, it was a tinge of BS in there somewhere, or, or it might have been the fact that Cliff was also an Englishman. But the, uh, I, I was also saying that someone told me in more recent years, in looking at the designs of aircraft, that the Americans put a crew together and then built an aircraft around them. Whereas the English built an aircraft and then said, oh, George, where are you going to put the bloody cockpit? Or, or someone to fly it? And you just fitted in corners with them. And, and I was on a, a Nimrod, one of the more recent designs of, of the British, although it was based on the Comet, which is one of the early ones. Um, you got on board a an Australian P3, therefore an American P3, and when you climbed up, you looked to the left and you could see out through the cockpit window. There was nothing obstructing you from the back to the front. But you got on the Nimrod, first thing to do when you got on board was turn left, go over to that side, and then go along the, a little way, and then turn right, and then go through some lounge in the centre, and then turn left again. And all the clutter was there that just took me back to, this is an English design. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry if uh, there are any English um, engineers or <laughs> aficionados or any other sort here, or designers, but, but um, I, I gathered by, and, and, and could underline the fact that, that there's a difference between Harry and Alan because Alan had a love affair associated with that aeroplane, <laughs> and uh, and Harry, well, he uh, learned to fly other aircraft as well. Although Harry and I know that he is a lousy bomb aimer, <laughs> because that's the first time I ever flew with him at a Kalgoorlie air show, and uh, we were using a Victor air tour to do a demonstration of flower bombing. Um, when we went out to the target afterwards to see how close Harry actually got when he threw the flower bag overboard, it hadn't arrived anywhere near the target. But because he put his head out of the cockpit to see it, his sunglasses were right on the target. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Harry and Alan, thank you very much for a different afternoon in many respects and would you please join me in, in showing appreciation for those who put together the